This video on Baroque explains why this particular epoch formed the current view of the city, how Vilnius became a Baroque city with a medieval street network, and why so often it is titled to be the most Italian city northeast the Alps. Following the 1569 union, Vilnius lost its political significance. The Grand Duke of the Three and King of Poland hardly ever came to the city. The actual rulers became prominent families like Radziwill, Sapirha, Gorstelte, Pats and Hotkevich, who constantly competed over the influence and lands and brought Baroque to medieval Vilnius. And just to mention, many of them studied abroad, primarily in Italy. Radziwill adopted Roman customs and architectonic taste and sponsored St. Casimir's Church, that is the first completed Baroque structure in Vilnius. The construction commenced in 1604, only slightly falling behind from the first ever Baroque church Il Gesù in Rome, completed in 1580. The church was designed by Italian Giovanni Maria Bernardoni, who followed the plan and architectural structure of Il Gesù. Unfortunately, present St. Casimir's church no longer resembles its Italian predecessor. Initial corrections were made starting 1750, following fire outbreaks, and a restored dome gained late Baroque forms. While in the 19th century, the Catholic Church became an Orthodox one, and during Soviet times, it was transformed into the Atheism Museum. Only in 1991, the dramatically changed building regained its original function. On the other hand, military achievements also brought Vilnius significant wealth. For example, in 1610, Lithuanians invaded Moscow, and treasure collected over three years of occupation served several noble generations. When rejoicing at safe return, the nobleman sponsored several churches. That is when Vilnius gained modest in exterior, but rich in interior Baroque masterpieces like St. Theresa's Church, All Saints Church and St. Casimir's Chapel at the cathedral. Italian masters worked on most of them. For instance, St. Casimir's Chapel and St. Theresa's Church were designed by Constantino Tenkala, who was the royal architect of Vladislav IV. Some years later, things changed significantly. In 1655, Cossacks invaded Vilnius and exhibited unprecedented ferocity by killing, raping and ravaging everything along the path, including the monasteries. Upon departing, they took everything of value and ripped off even the copper roof tin sheets from St. Casimir's chapel. Anything too heavy to carry was set on fire. Despite incredible devastation, Vilnius managed to recover and witness the flourishing of high Baroque. Next to two Michelangelo Poloni frescoes at St. Casimir's Chapel, St. Peter and Paul's Church emerged in Antaculus district. Here, Italian masters Giovanni Maria Galli and Pietro Perti created unmatched interior with over 2,000 stucco molds imitating angels, saints and dark powers of hell. A new era brought new disasters. Throughout the 18th century, the city was haunted by fires. The largest ones occurred in 1737, 48 and 49. After that, Vilnius changed completely and new authorities emerged. The most notable one was Glaubitz from Silesia. He reworked many Renaissance, early Baroque and even Gothic churches in the late Baroque manner thus giving birth to a distinctive Vilnian Baroque style, which significantly diverges from the West. A characteristic feature became two identical, often white and very tall towers tapering upward, alluding to Gothic grace. The contrast of direction and space was emphasized. Large masses counterbalanced with sudden verticals and playful curves. To take an example, St. Catherine's towers gradually rise upward, dissolving into playful decorative volutes and urns. Or even more graceful, missionary church, situated atop the hill, is still the dominant foreground of Vilnius landscape. One could compare its towers to the eastern minarets shooting up the sky. The secret of the distinctive graceful proportions originates in the relation between width and height, which is 1 to 10. Both St. Catherine's and missionary churches were reconstructed by Glaubitz himself. Over two centuries, the city scenery changed significantly, yet the street network remained medieval. Baroque and Vilnius did not conform to the Western city planning tendencies and novelties. No spacious panoramas, no views to the distant churches and palaces, not to mention the fact that the city has not a single Baroque square, park or fountain. 
Famous noble lady Ludwika Bishevska visited Vilnius in 1787 and wrote in her diary, quote, I noticed that the streets are narrow, cramped with debris, brick houses are neglected, shabby, endangering the passers-by, ballast yards when swept since Vitotas, end of quote. Next to that, she described exceptional fascination with city sanctuaries and Sapia her palace in Antakarnes. Even today, Vilnius old town remains cramped and intricate. The streets are endlessly curving, going up or down the hill, and the opposite end of the street is hardly visible. The splendor of Baroque churches can only be observed from the elevated viewpoints or standing right in front of it. This particular epoch formed the glory of present Vilnius. The style came almost on time, but remained much longer than anywhere else in the West. When Glaubus was reconstructing the churches in late Baroque style, Europe was already deep into the Enlightenment and Classicism ideas, together with portico-decorated palaces and white-planted boulevards fit for carriage traffic. Classicism reached Vilnius as well, but rather late, and without any impact on the medieval street network or Italian Baroque silhouette. 